Good day, coaches. Welcome back to episode two of the Hockey Eastern Ontario Skill Acquisition Series. We are very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Ed Coughlin. Uh, Ed, I hope I have that pronounced right. I hope it is Coughlin. It's close, close enough. enough. It's close, close enough. enough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Coughlin holds a PhD in skill acquisition and currently is a senior lecturer in skill acquisition and sports science and coaching science at um, Munster Technological University in Ireland. Uh, welcome, Ed. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand it over to you a little bit just to fill our coaches in on who you are, your journey in this world of skill acquisition, and give us a little bit of a background on your bio. Super. Uh, Brian, thank you very much, and hello to anyone listening in. Uh, absolute pleasure to to join the, the series and uh, really appreciate the invitation. Um, so my journey into skill acquisition probably started a long, long time ago. Um, I, I, I grew up in quite a sporty family, so um, sport was always uh, around. There was always rackets and sticks and, and balls to be kicked and caught and thrown and so on and so forth. Um, and as I kind of went through my childhood, played lots of different sports, um, eventually found my way towards you know, in coaching and while coaching, uh, was very curious about what kind of coaching I wanted to do. Found myself heavily involved in strength and conditioning and movement specialism type of trying to figure out better ways for people to move more efficiently and the likes. That took me down a very strong route around working in, in, in several Olympic game cycles, working on the physical preparation of athletes. Um, but as I was doing that, I was always kind of struck by the differences between maybe some of the, the best uh, and the rest was oftentimes their capacity to be um, skillful under pressure in those, in those key moments. And that piqued my interest, sent me back to university, in fact, with a real clear... Um, a real clear focus and target to try and figure out more about what skill was about. Um, and was it, is it, was it confined just to the, the domain of psychology? I knew it always would sit in psychology, but was there another way of unpicking it, let's say? Um, after four years of university, I, I was very fortunate to get picked up to do a PhD in skill acquisition with one of the world's leading experts in the, in the domain, Professor Mark Williams in John Moore's University and his colleague, Paul Ford. And that, has had you know that's going back quite a while now but but that has sent me to continue to ask the questions that I was asking even before I went to university and it, it sent me down the path of asking even more questions um, and ask as many people as many questions and, uh, and be prepared to be asked as many questions because I think it's a hugely important but it's also quite a complex um, domain and space that we're, we're kind of talking about so that all that time I was coaching throughout all my PhD and the like, um, but in more recent years, my coaching has it takes two forms, uh, three forms actually, two forms. One, I'm a dad now, uh, so I've got two boys that play loads of different sports, so I'm a volunteer coach, dad with them. Um, the second way, second form of my work in skill acquisition is around with coaches. I do quite a lot of coach mentoring and coach consultation with either national governing bodies or individual team coaches or individual sport coaches. Um, and then finally, I coach myself um, and predominantly nowadays, pretty much solely in pro professional golf, uh, working as a skills coach with golfers um, across all the, the big tours in the world, which is kind of nice. Um, and yeah, the, the, a lot of similar questions come up in all of those three domains between working with kids. I have a 10 year old and a 14 year old and the other dads and that help out in those sports, working with professional coaches and also working with, 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 uh, working with professional athletes. And the constant thing is I seem to, the constant thing for me is I seem to, my, my curiosity has not waned in all those years and, all the, and in those different environments about trying to just figure it out a little bit better and a little bit smoother. And if I can, if I can maybe encourage others to be a bit curious along the way, great. Um, and if I can encourage others to push back against me, even better, because I think the more pushback I get at times, and the more challenging questions I get, by, especially by the coaches and, 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 and oftentimes the, the players too, but the coaches, because they really are trying to figure stuff out. Um, I love that kind of environment, Brian, to be perfectly honest. I love going into an environment, spending a few days with coaches, and they're like, 
we're trying to figure this out. We hear one thing or this other thing and so on and so forth. And, and I love that. I love just getting into the weeds with other people and just being in the room and saying, I don't know either, but let's see if we can figure things out. So that's, that's my life, I suppose, in skill acquisition. I, I love every part of it because in the university here, I lead a research team in skill acquisition. And, um, and that kind of informs the work we'll do with our undergrads. But we've got a pretty significant research, postgraduate research group here. And uh, skill acquisition is the, the hub of all of that too. <laughs> so it's in everything I do. So, um, so yeah, I always, always happy to chat about it. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, we are, we are thrilled that you're joining us. Um, we will try to ask some questions that probably will push back a little bit and we'll dig into right. some things. So I'm going to open with probably the most common question you get day after day after day. Ed, what is skill? <laughs> well, for me, skill is the capacity to do a task within the context that the task is needed to be done. So for me, that brings in in, sport, in the sport environment, can I kick a ball? I can Okay, that's something that I can technically do. I can kick a ball. Now, can I kick a ball when I want to pass it to somebody? That's the skill. That's where it's like, well, I have, I have an effective ability to pass the ball to the target that I wanted to. Or in that, if that's in football, it's kicking it. If that's in hockey, it's hitting it with the stick. If that's in tennis, it's hitting it with the racket. So we, again, you could give a person a tennis racket who's never played tennis and they'll be able to hit the ball. So I can hit a ball. Now, can you hit the ball to the area of the court that you want in the context of the point that is being played at that moment or the game and so on and so forth? And I think when you bring context and the color of the situation into um, something that is technical, then it becomes a skill. Uh, or not, as the case may be, whether you're able to execute that technical um, task in those moments. So in some, for me, the skill is the execution of a task in a, in a context. So the question I love to ask coaches when I do coach training, and I ask of myself a lot, can an athlete, can we deem an athlete to be skilled when they are not operating within a game context? It's difficult to do that. We have plenty of examples of athletes in sports who are incredibly, what we would class, skillful when we look at them. So again, um, basketballers, really fantastic with the footwork and even be able to bounce two basketballs at the same time and do all these fantastic tricks on their own. But then they go into a game and they're ineffective. So are they skillful within a particular parameter of what it looks like? Oh, this person is really efficient at bouncing this ball and putting it between their legs and doing all fancy tricks. But are they able to translate it into, into the competitive domain of what the game of basketball is, which is a 5v5 court-based sport? With, if they're not able to do that, well, then I would say then it is, it's a skill that maybe is not transferring into the domain of, of choice, let's say. I think it's an interesting one because, of course, they've acquired skills, okay? They've acquired skills, but are those skills adaptable and are those skills transferable into a, a, an ever-changing environment? If not, then maybe we, we, we might need to slow down. So again, to, to give more detail on that. You've got a hockey player who's phenomenal with their stick work, incredible with the moves on the ice, incredible with their wrist action and putting the puck on either side of the, 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 the head of the stick and so on and so forth. And it looks very impressive. And it is, very, it, it is skillful to do that. But if it, and, and in that, you know, in a separated environment, it looks impressive. But if in a game environment where the game of... Um, ice hockey exists, if it's not translating to there, then, then the questions I, I would be asking, well, how skillful is that person? So to say that they're not skillful at all might be a bit harsh <laughs> on them because 
it's quite a tricky thing to do some of the things that we were watching them do. And I right. think a really, good, a really good example of this is in, in, in football or soccer, as you guys might know. It, okay? w- the game of soccer is 11 v 11. Okay? And in the game, or the context of the game that's happening around it, then there's a whole load of skills that are required to be able to be proficient and, and effective in a game situation. But there's also a whole other um, sport with the exact same ball, which is people who, are, who do um, basically skills competitions. They don't ever play the game, but they actually are showing people the tricks that they can do with a, ga- with a football. Uh, how many times they can keep it up and how many different things they, they'll do with their, their feet, their knees, their hands, their shoulders, their heads. It's this exact same ball that they're doing this with, okay, these superbly skilled tricksters, but does all of that translate into a game of soccer? Probably not, you know, because they've probably honed these skills in this very particular way, but does it translate and transfer in? Maybe, but maybe not to. And I think that's because when they're doing those little separated skills that look really impressive, they're not engaging with anything around them. But of course, in a game environment, you're engaging with lots of things around you. Right. And that's, so I think your original question, if, 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 can we call them skillful if they're not doing the game? Of course we can. I think we have to be careful that we don't, you know, cut Cut, you know, cut the legs out from somebody just because, but maybe it's just a case saying you're skillful, but can we work on you now to be able to translate that skill into the, into the context of the game environment, let's say. Okay. Um, because we see this in all sports. We see this in every single sport. People who are fantastic with refined skills, but then struggle to translate them into the, into the real world, let's say. Into the game. Mm. So... I suppose if I may, that speaks to the work I do. What, what, if you were asking me, what's my job with, with athletes? I'm a practice coach. I will go in and I will do an audit with a, co- with a player. Okay, talk to me. What's your problem? And again, pro golfers. Oh, but Ed, when I play the practice run, I'm this and this is what I'm shooting. When I'm on the range, you should see the shots I'm in on the range, on the chipping green, the putting green. The, then I go out and I shoot this number. And I'm like, okay, so can I have a look? Let, let me audit your practice environment. And then I'll... Oftentimes, they'll come back and say, but your practice environment does not, it doesn't reflect what you then talk to me about, what, what, it, what it's like on the golf course. So we need to get them closer. And it's, about, and it's actually about trying to get the competitive golf course environment closer, going that direction to the practice, not the other way around. We don't want the practice. We don't want the, you to be doing things on the golf course that are very similar to what you're doing on the range. No, no. We want your range stuff to look more and more like what you do on the golf course. Golf course. Okay. We're going to come, we're going to come full circle right back to that point okay. very, very quickly. But I wanted to just dig a little bit more into the, the skill versus technique. Are you skillful? Are you technical? <laughs> and I, lo- I love the example you used because I think it ties into something that Stuart Armstrong talked about when we talked about ecological dynamics and the impact of the environment on the athlete and the environment's impact on almost determining your skillful ability. Mm. So when you talk about a, 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 a person, a person who either plays soccer or ice hockey five on five, 11 v 11, and they have all this technical ability that translates and is adaptable and we call them a skilled athlete. But then you take a person who has all these Soccer techniques, dribbling the ball off their head, their chest, all the fancy things. Is part of your argument that we can still call them skilled based on the fact that they're working in an environment that is not 11 v 11? So we're really not judging their skillful ability based on, oh, you're using a soccer ball, you're looking like a soccer player, but you're really not in the soccer game. Your environment is this area here. And within that environment, you are very skillful. So if I took a hockey player, if I took a very technical hockey player and I put them in an environment, a constructed environment that is not five on five on the full hockey rink. Mm -hmm. And I had that person do all kinds of tricks and techniques in that environment. Can I say for that environment, they are skilled? 
Mm. But if I took them out of that environment and put them in the real game and all that fancy stuff disappears, they're not skilled in the real game. They're skilled in this environment. They're not skilled in that environment. Yeah. Is that, is that correct to be able to I, be think, able to... I think that's fair. I think that's fair. But I also think that's a really powerful tool as a coach-athlete interaction then. So then you're able to speak to the athlete and say, hey, man, over here, I know I can see what you can do. Your stick work is incredible. Your capacity to turn and your capacity to be able to take a challenge and, con- and you know, so in the, uh, let, me, let me separate these properly. On the ice in a game environment, you're, it's, sorry, I've actually gone the wrong way around here. So over here when we're doing the technical stuff and it looks fantastic and it's in an isolated environment, it's so impressive. And it is. You clearly stand out as one of the most technically proficient players that we have when we do it in an isolated way. However, let me ask you, and that's where the, the, this is then the interaction. Let me ask you, are you as technically proficient when we take you on the ice and we go into a small-sided game on the ice, a full-sided game on the ice? Are you, do you feel you're able to access all of those Skills? Do you need all of those skills? Are you able to do? And he and he. The likely answer is, well, no, I can't because someone tackles me. I don't get a chance to do ten in a row of really fancy hand hand work and you know. And so, okay, well, so then we, so then there's a, a disconnect. So then there's a gap between how technically proficient you may be, and it looks impressive, but as coaches, we don't we don't measure your efficiency your proficiency over here we measure whether or not it's effective on the ice in a game against an opposition so it may look good here it may be impressive to watch over here but if it's not translating here well then that's the gap and then that's right. the question again i'll be going through the athlete what's the gap difference oh well I'm, I'm not being challenged by someone over here okay so how would you change your practice over here because it's really impressive but what's missing over here that is, well, I'm not being, a, there's no opponent. Okay, so will we stick in an opponent? Oh, yeah, maybe that would work. Because, and why would we stick in an opponent? Well, because that's a bit more like what happens when I go on the ice and we put on all the padding and we're ready to rumble. Okay. Now, I'm not saying, I'm just, I just want you to be aware. If you do all of that stuff over there and it's not transferring, you've got to ask better questions of yourself when you are in that isolated environment. Why is it not transferring? What is it that you feel you lack when you go in there? Oh, I don't have as much time over there to do those things. Okay. So what else maybe do we need to add into that environment? An opponent, but also maybe uh, an additional, not just a 1v1 opponent, but an option, a decision type scenario, which is in a sense, another form of an opponent. I've got to now think about, I've got to engage in something else. You know, something else is, calling on me to give my attention to it if when i'm over here i know i'm never going to be tackled i know what i want to do when i want to do it so i will get very 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 narrow in my focus right yeah i will get very very narrow in the attention that i'm because i'm just i have the next 10 10 meters and 10 yards in front of me. No problem. I can do whatever I want over here (laughs) because no one's going to get in my way. And then I go in here and I get the puck and I want to now do my my move because it's all in my head. It's predetermined. I like to do this. And a guy takes me out and pushes me up against the glass. Well, hang on, but you didn't give me time to do my move. That's not my job. (laughs) My job is to throw you off. Yeah, my job is to throw you off your move. Yeah. You know? So I think we have to be, and again, I'm, uh, I, I just want us, to especially, look, I'm 30 years coaching this year, Brian. And if I go back over the 30 years, I know there was, mo- there was times when I was really lost. And I mean, like properly, hang on a second, this, <laughs> what I think it should be, and so on and so forth. So I'm always... Because of the work I, 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 I love doing now with coaches and, and, and or even at a, a higher level up, we can, you know, not just the coaches on the ground, but the national governing bodies and be like, 
I have that empathy of like, I've been there myself. I know it is a head scratcher at times because I know how I would have coached, how I was coached. I know it. Right. And, I, and I got a real sense when I began to really reflect on what I was doing. There was that first period of time in my coaching career when I was like, oh my God, I'm just coaching the way I was, I've been coached. <laughs> so, and then if I actually think back, hang on, that, those coaches were only coaching the way they were coached. And all of a sudden I'm beginning to realize I'm coaching in the 1990s in ways that people were coaching in the 1950s and 60s yeah. and 70s. Yeah, it just keeps going from generation it just keeps to generation. Going to because generation. I, yeah. And, I, and that's when I began to ask those questions. Every, it's, it's, something's not transferring. Something's not translating. If I go back in, what is, what, you know, I'm at a party. So I'm like, what do you do, it? <laughs> I said, you know, my job is to try and create as effective practice environments. So when players go to compete, there's a real sense that this feels like it does in practice. Right. But what I hear when I first meet with teams and players and coaches, they say it doesn't. It's the opposite. And I'll actually hear things like, but they're so good in practice. Ed. When we do that drill over there, so good. And then, and then they get annoyed with the players. It's not translating. It's trans not transferring into the game. And I'm like, no, because that's nothing like the game. So you, and, and again, it's to, and then it's how we engage with that is important. Can we engage with that in, an, in a welcoming way, in a soft way to say, hey, man, it's cool. <laughs> well, I've been there. Yeah. So let's just gently take us through because it, the, the questions that we have, and, and again, some, like, some of the, the coaches that I work with, men and women, the, the coaches that I work with, the, the, uh, their eyes will tell me a lot sometimes when all of a sudden there's, there's a moment of, ha, ah, I see what you mean. You know, it actually, it actually is like a pressure valve coming, coming up, being let, let out because they'll go from thinking, it, but it's not working. I need, they need to do more of this to all of a sudden, ha, huh. <laughs> it's actually the fact that they're doing so much of that, which is killing the transfer. Right. So wait, what if we reverse engineer it? This is what the game looks like. This is the environment we want them to be strong. And how can we move that over here? And how much of it can we retain while we move it over to the practice environment? And all of a sudden, you should see very little difference. You know, uh, Jonah Oliver has a brilliant phrase that he talks about. Um, he's a br uh, brilliant phrase. He said, you know, the competition, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, competition day should, should very much feel like a practice day, just on a special occasion. So it, there should be as much of those feelings. And, that, and that's... If I dial back 20 odd years to what I was, what was like, it was all very modularized. It was all very, we're going to do this bit and then we're going to do that bit and then we're going to do this bit and then we're, we're magically going to all come about when we go in and play a game at the end because that's the way I was coached, right, you know? Yeah. And as a coach, I was ticking my box and I had my pad in my hand and I was like, I've done that bit, that bit, that bit so I can tick. I'm happy that as a coach, I've checked off all the different aspects of this sport. If I break them down and put them in these little separate decomposed areas. Now, let's go in and hope that they all magically appear when we go. And then, then the frustration will come out. Jeez, hang on. We just did a passing drill over there and no one dropped a ball. And now they're dropping. Come on, guys. And I'm getting annoyed and I'm getting frustrated. And I'm like, and then that was the moment of... Well, technically, <laughs> over here, when the technique, in one sense, it is skill, of course, because they're, they're doing a motor action. And in that environment, it's skillful. But it's not skillful in the environment we really want it to be in. In the game, yeah. In the game. I want to drill more into that because that was sort of the, the, the we, we kind of were segueing into the second area where I wanted to go. The impact, the impact on all of this theoretical information on what skill is. What does it mean to be skillful? How do players acquire skill? The difference between skill and technique. All of that at some point, that knowledge and information, at some point has to impact on a coach to help that coach adjust their practice or training environment to, 
to, to gear it to be more suited to skillful development or acquisition over technique. Before we jump there, though, Ed, very quickly, and after listening to where we've come, I almost have a feeling that you're going to say, well, there's really no difference, but there is a difference, and it's going to be a very gray area. But do you have a distinct difference between what skill is versus what technique is? So, because I in hockey, and I imagine it's the same in some other sports. Mm -hmm. In hockey, I feel sometimes that we we always talk about the two of them using the word skill. Mm -hmm. So we watch a hockey player skating around the ice in practice, mm -hmm. unopposed, not game like, no representative transfer. But we look at them and go, "Boy, he or she is a beautifully skilled skater." Mm -hmm. Well, are they a skill? Is that a skill we're watching or is that a technique we're watching? And then as coaches, we want to turn it into skill. Mm. So I see, I, I see you smirking <laughs> and laughing. So I can imagine where this is going to go. <laughs> yeah, because it is a gray area because of that. Because what you are watching is someone, and albeit in that moment, is it difficult? Like if you're from Ireland, and you're watching someone skate the way you're the way hockey players skate, and you're thinking, wow. <laughs> you know, we would be like baby giraffes on the first day they were born and the wobbly, you know. But to see guys who actually are more comfortable in skates than they are probably in footwear, you know, walking in uh, uh, walking on the road, because they're just that's that's a skill. Of course it's a skill. Now, when the, in the sport context though. And that's the key word here, context. When we layer a context of a sport in, then we're asking more of that skill. Now, you just said there, you, you assume that this is the case in other, in other sports. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, I know, but Ed, our sport is very technical, as if no other sport is, because they do. Everyone thinks that their sport is the most technically sure. challenging sport. And it's, you know, and I'm like... Okay, look, if there's somebody trying to do something, it's, there's some form of technique somewhere in there. You know, even the simple case of uh, weightlifting, you know, the technical proficiency to re be required back in the day when I, that was my, my, my bread and butter of being able to squat effectively and efficiently and, all, and safely and so on. Well, of course, there's a technical aspect to being able to squat, but then being able to squat there's a skill to doing it as it gets heavier because there's a lot more things that are actually going on but that people in that and outside of that environment wouldn't even know about that ability to be adaptable and that's where that's where i'm get, moving to here skill compared to technique skill is more about adaptability your capacity to be able to be to be able to engage in this technical task whatever it is it is a skill but is it adaptable and in the sport environment, adaptability is, is hugely important because we may be technically proficient at something in an isolated area, but in, when we go into a game environment, all bets are off. Why? Because we don't know what the opposition are going to do. We can do some performance analysis to try and get a read on it, look back in former games, see what kind of plays they are set up tactically. But still, there's huge variability in all of the different scenarios that might unfold in front of us. It's, so the adaptability of that skill is what will move it more towards there being a difference between something technically sound and proficient and it being a skillful um, execution of a task. It sounds like you almost have two definitions for skill. I can be skilled in a technical, isolated environment, mm -hmm. or I can be skilled in an adaptable game environment. Hmm. Is that? Am I yeah, close well, I, there? So I, I'd have some some friends. Some friends of mine would like to, you know, 
put for and have put forward and and are right to put forward and that's why these conversations are great they'll say it's less about skill acquisition and more about skill adaptation okay that's a term that they'll say it's not about acqu acquiring something and again i think that's where there's a bit of gray area when i think of skill acquisition i think it's acquiring a skill that is adaptable i don't ever think when i hear skill acquisition i'm not thinking oh that's the skill you've acquired and that's it no, I'm, I'm assuming it's, you've, for me, when I think of skill acquisition, you've acquired a skill that's adaptable. And that's, that's where that capacity of a skilled performer is one where they are able to engage with what's happening in front of them and still be able to execute the required skills. Gotcha. That they will have acquired through practice and so on and so forth but it's how effective and how robust those skills are in those, in those critical moments. Do you equate, when you say the skill being adaptable, does that, is that the same as being transferable? I think they're in the same ballpark because okay. again, we want, and again, when we, when we, look, when we look at, at what's adaptability, Adaptability, and again, this, the, the different schools of thought on this are quite clear. What are we talking about adaptability? We're talking about variability, okay? We're talking about how variable is the environment that you're going in, and are you able to adapt to that or, or not? Now, another school of thought will be they will think that it's adjusting, which is kind of adjustability. Is it adju are you adjusting your technique to here, or are you adapting? your technique to hear. Okay. For me, I'm more in the school of thought of, um, of adapting, that I've acquired a skill that is adaptable, that um, if I need to, you know, if again, on the ice, and if I have a shot that I need to pass, pass the puck to a player, and I'm not going to use the same amount of force if that player is one meter away from me, you know, three feet, as if they're 60 feet away from me. Of course not. You know, that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm adapting based on what I see in front of me. Right. He or she is really close to me or really far away from me, you know? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adapt. I'm going to make a small little adapt, uh, adaptation to, to the movement to, to engage with that. So when, I, when you think about transferability, the quality of the environment that I learned this skill right. about passing, the quality of that environment will increase the likelihood of it transferring. If it transfers really well, well, then there's high adaptability in that skill. If it does not transfer really well, well, then there's low adaptability, and then I will be looking again back to the environment that, uh, within which okay. that skill was being learned. Okay. So when you just described that adaptability example of a player with a puck, being able to look at their environment and determine is the player, the receiver close, far away? Is there pressure? Are there things I need to perceive and account for? We call that in hockey, that, that's what we call read and react. We, we read the environment and then we react to that. Okay. So when we talk about a player being skillful and those skills are adaptable, Really what it sounds like we're saying is I've, I've developed my players in a way that allows them to come into the game context, to come into the real game environment and take the skill of passing and they can now adapt it, apply it in a variety of different ways to suit the problem they need to solve. Of which that problem that they need to solve may never be presented to them twice in a game. It may right. be, <laughs> and and they may have sixty passes in the game, but no one pass will be the same because it might be the same distance, but it might be a different angle off the 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 the, the head of their uh, hockey stick. It might be the same distance with the same angle, but it might be because it has to be rushed because there's a player coming in, or it might like it's. And that's where the adaptability is hugely important, that that adaptability is also an integral part of their practice environment. And that's why I would be encouraging, uh, not forcing, 
because I don't think forcing works. Um, I, th I would be encouraging coaches and athletes just to ask themselves those questions. What I'm doing here, does it show up in the game? Oh, yeah, it does. I, I pass. Okay. And what were you doing? Well, I was doing, um, you know, I had a, a, the, the side of the rink next to me and I had a batch of 20 pucks at my feet. And I did one and two and three. And I, and I, and I, and I do this action in the game. And I, so it's really good. And, I, and that's going to transfer. And I was like, okay. And why, why, why will it transfer? Because I do the exact same action here as I do out there. Okay. Why might it not transfer though? Is the question I would ask. Oh, well, and then you get all the answers. Because they, again, players have a really good idea about, you'll ask, if you ask them to describe what happens in a game and describe what happens in practice, that question is one that oftentimes does not get asked. They will give you different answers. Now, if they don't give you different answers, it means that there is really strong correlation between the practice environment and the competition environment, which is a good thing for me. I like to hear that. But if they're giving you very different answers, I was saying, wow, so how is your practice environment so different? So I'll get that. I'll ask a, like, one of those questions of a, a pro golfer. If an alien came down to earth and said, okay, can you describe golf to me? And they're, oh, you've got to play 18 holes and you've got 14 clubs in your bag and they're all of different lengths, unless you're Bryson DeChambeau, with different lofts on them and so on and so forth. And wherever I am, the distance that I can pick out a club and that club will go that distance and so on and so forth. And, and, but, and, and so, all right, and, and, uh, but hang on, but the lies are different every time and it's in different grasses and different height of grass and well, the wind conditions and the this and the, oh wow, uh, yeah, it's very complex. And how do you practice for that? Well, I stand in the same place <laughs> over and over again with the same club hitting the same shot. Sorry, I know I'm an alien, so I don't get it, but I just thought you described the game like this. No, no, I, that, that is the game. So why do you practice it that way? Ah, oh, well, you know, I, I need to lock in a technique and I need to, okay, so is the technique that you're locking in the same technique for every shot? Yeah, it needs to be. All right. But what if it's on a downhill lie or an uphill lie or a, or a, or, 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 oh, I, and it just, that's where it can get very bottleneck -y, very, uh, uh, and that's where then you begin to start asking questions about, talk to me about the culture of the game, of the sport that you play. What are the traditions? What are the, you know, what are the, historically, how do people practice? And all of a sudden you begin to realize, ah, huh, so you're just practicing this way because everyone else before you has practiced this way. Okay. Is it worth exploring, challenging what has been done before to see is there a better way? And I'm not saying that, all those who have gone before have practiced poorly, but I'm just saying may, maybe, they, maybe they could have improved on their practice. And maybe the greats of the game, that, of whatever sport it is, maybe they could have even been better. Imagine that. Imagine how good the game, like imagine how good the game would have been that you grew up watching if they practiced in an even more uh, representative way. Does that make sense? Have I gone around it, in circles? It makes <laughs> perfect sense. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep expanding on this because this is really kind of where this is where I really want to go for the benefit of the coaches that are gonna listen and, hmm. and watch this uh, recording of this podcast down the road or and use it as a resource. I, I can see this, Brian, being the first of twelve episodes. Um, <laughs> It, it could be like, yeah, like, and I, I struggled with how many of these to do. And I thought five would work. And I came out of the one with Stu last week thinking the same thing. I could have done two or three more with Stu. I will, I will end this one today and think maybe we need to get Ed back and, and talk some I more. Get, I get. Hi, hi coaches. We've got Ed back on the line again. Okay. So this is the 10th time we've heard it, but that's, that, but that's all part of it though. Yeah. You know, the, the, the it is about just trying to move the dial a little bit, but also then realizing, whoa, we've just opened up a big, you know, big can here. So, but anyway, yeah, sorry, your next question, sorry. So, so for coaches, from, from a coaching perspective, and we've, and we've, hint, we've, we've, we've kind of danced around this for a little bit now about the practice environment. I'm a coach. I'm listening to this, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I say to myself, I want to start changing my practice environment 
so that my players can become more skillful. Skill acquisition will be increased. Skill will acquire better with my athletes. It will transfer to the game better, and it will be adaptable at game time. I've got all these skill things I now want to target. I want my players to be so good, so skilled, and I just don't want them to look pretty. I want them to look technically pretty, smooth, efficient, but I want to transfer it and see it in the game. And when I see it in the game, I also want them to be able to say, oh, this problem is different from that problem, and I'm going to use that same technique slash skill to solve those two problems effectively. What do I have to start doing in practice to start moving myself and my athletes in that direction? And here's the okay, other so twelve. And now, it... now, now we need the other twelve episodes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think I, I'll use a word that I used previously. There needs to be an audit done on the game environment. If you ask your by coaches, the coach or by or the coach and, and 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 the and the athlete guys, describe. Let's say I've I've never been to an ice hockey match in person. I've watched it, as I uh, I'm a bit like that. I I love ice hockey. I've, I spoke with lacrosse coaches uh, last year sometime. I was like, I love lacrosse. Never played it in my life, but I love what. Like if it's on, I'll watch it. If it's if it's the, the sport, I'll watch it. And yes, then when I go back over my, you know, and the Stanley Cup and all the Wayne Gretzky's here, the, I, any anything that I was being fed as a kid into our house from either Canada, the States, Australia, if it was a sport, I'd be watching it. So I've never seen, I've never been to a game, but I, could, I, I know, I understand it, and the power plays, and I, I, so from watching it. So I would be asking, like the stupid question, describe to me what, a, what a, a, a game of hockey is. What, what is it? And then I would be asking, him, so describe to me what your practice is like. And that's the audit. That's that sense check of why are you using different words and phrases to describe the game to what you're describing in practice? Why are you using, why are you describing scenarios that emerge in a game and you never mentioned those scenarios emerging in practice? Hang on. There's a disconnect. Why are you, dis why are you talking about the, uh, the unpredictability that happens in a game, the excitement that happens in the game, the so many decisions that need to be made in a game. And yet in training, you, it doesn't sound very exciting. Um, there's not much need for any unpredictable because you, you're told what to do, when to do it, where to go, who to hit it to, when to hit it, when to move. There's no. And as far as decision making and all of that, it's been made for you because of those very ordered, structured, you know. And then down to, you know, that, that final phase of, okay, so these are these scenarios. As I said, you, these are the scenarios you talk about that happen in a game, but they don't seem to emerge in, 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 in training. It's been refined and reduced down. It's been, you know, decompartmentalized too much in practice. So I would be asking that question, why is there so much separation? Why is there so much decomposition in the practice environment? I'm not saying that you're not allowed, okay? And that's, and that's, a, that's a point that I get back to about maybe, uh, we, we might come back to this, maybe the, the, the current toxicity that's kind of around the place about the, the discussion that's been had between the different schools of thought about skill acquisition. So I'm not one of, I'm not standing here saying you have to do, and you have, I'm just saying that let's just ask some good questions. So to go back to your question, what are we yeah. saying to coaches? I'm asking coaches, do an audit on your, on the game. Just write it, just talk about it. Have someone sit down just next to you and be like, huh, so I've asked three coaches to describe what a hockey is. Now, I've asked the same three coaches to describe, to talk to me about what your practice is. 
are they using the same words? Are they using the same phrases? Are they using the same, are the same scenarios coming up back? Are, and if they are, well, that's probably a very closely aligned uh, representative type of practice environment. If they're not, well, then it's the opposite. It's, you know, modularized, modularized it's, it's broken down, it's, it's a real checklist, we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And, it, you know, it's all very separate and it's all broken apart and, and decomposed, let's say. That's then where I'd be saying, okay, well, then how can we layer in a little bit of what you, you mentioned? You mentioned this. How can we see a little bit more of it? When, when you're doing your, um, you know, from one cone to another cone that's 30 feet away and you've got side to side, side to side, and I'm sure they're brilliant with the stick work and the puck is going either side of this hockey stick. Can we just add in somebody that they have to get their head up maybe? That they've got to decide which way do I go? Do, and what is it that I'm, oh, it's a bit of variability. I'm still, I still want you to do this movement, but now you've got to decide. And this person is going to make a move for you, and you've got to choose to either go around them or pass it off. Straight away, you've just created a scenario that may happen. And, and all of a sudden, in that, and that's just a very simple, just single layer of adding a little bit of variability, adding a little bit of representativeness, adding a little bit of reality into the practice environment. What automatically happens in those situations is you've got less people standing around waiting for their turn because all of a sudden now I'm a, I'm a disruptor in the middle. I'm a stimulus that they've got to engage with. It's a, there's a, I've got to perceive something and I've got to act as a result of what I've seen, it's seen in front of me, you know, as opposed to you know, going through the process. So one, one of the things that I, I, I'll often do uh, or, or, or comment I'll say to people is or, a question I'll ask coaches will be, how often, you know, what are the behaviors of the players when they're, when they're in game mode? Or what is the behavior of the, the player when he's on the course or in where, wherever? But so let's keep it in hockey. When they're on the ice and it's a, it's a match against a game against an opposition, what are their behaviors like? And you'll hear, oh, he's oh, super super tough, so aggressive, da, 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 so decisive, so what, whatever, you're right? And you're like, all right, and can you show me him in practice, please? How often do we never see those behaviors emerging in a practice environment? Because those behaviors that we see in a game are as a result of what's happening around them. But we go to a practice environment and those behaviors aren't there because the same stimulus is not happening in that practice environment. And we're like, so hang on, you're, you're, you're missing a beat here. The behaviors are even different. They're not interacting and engaging in this. They're in the same environment. They're on ice with a stick and their skates. And da, da, da. But because it's not in a game environment, they're, they're just a shell of the person that, that we see when all of a sudden, right, guys, it's a 3v3 and you've got 30 seconds to score and you've got to start down this end, but you don't have possession. Go. Boom. And we're on. You know, and it's that sense of uh, that audit. I am encouraging coaches constantly. And again, it's not easy, this. And again, and I say to coaches, take your time. Don't get it frustrated when you're, when you're, you're struggling to get that, to, to really figure out that audit. Great. Let's get on a call. Let's have it. Show me the footage. What were you looking at? What did you see? Because my, and I, and it's, it's big thing that I'm trying to do and, I, and it's, I've, the reason I'm trying to do is I'm probably still trying to do it with myself to just have a soft landing for coaches as they're trying to figure stuff out I think oftentimes we create a very harsh hard landing spot that number one will either turn them off wanting to learn because they'll feel intimidated by it yep. and number, number two they won't learn they will, because they, really, they really feel like I, I got it and they're, they're rushed and they're you know Let's create, let's create an environment where coaches really feel, I want to give this a go. And I'm not going to have to try and figure it all out in one session. And I just want to just maintain a sense of curiosity about the game and the practice environment. 
And why are they different? And if they're different, and if they have to be different, that's okay. But do I have a rationale for why they have to be different? And if I do, great. But if I'm struggling to come up with a rationale for why they have to be different, or if the rationale I have or have had isn't quite adding up for me anymore, you know, then let's create an environment where people can ask. They can get on a call with Brian, you know, and be like, but at the moment, in some environments, it can be quite intimidating, and I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like the idea that coach education and learning and figuring stuff out is intimidating to people. Then we're not doing a good job. I, in fact, I, and that goes back to the point I was, I was making earlier. There are some exceptional people. There's kind of, kind of, two schools of thought about the, at the moment around skill acquisition. You know, is it information processing? Is it, you know, is it all about indirect perception? Is this all about, you know, like being very linear and, and breaking it down and then building it back up and so on, so on, you know. And there's the ecological side, as you mentioned, you know, is it much more about engaging the environment? It's nonlinear. It's, it's trying to uh, couple everything together and so on and so forth. And that's great. These are two theoretical sides of a fantastic discussion. Right. What concerns me at times is that we've got um, bad people on both sides <laughs> trying to push an agenda and force things on people. We've got exceptional people on both sides too. And I would love there to be the exceptional people are heard more rather than the louder rattling cans, people who have an agenda or an ego or, you know what I mean? Because if we, if we dial it back to the, to the forefathers and fore, foremothers of, of all of these theories, these people themselves are only trying to figure it out too. And yet we, we have in 2023, people who said, well, he said this and this is what he meant. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> He's just trying to figure it out. He put it yeah, in a paper. It got, you know what I mean? And I think, I think for all of these, you ask the question, what are we, should we say to coaches? We should be asking them to audit that game that they love, that they coach. They coach for nothing. You know, they, they've played it all their lives and they now coach it. How reflective of the game is it in the practice environment? And if they want to take that journey to be a bit more curious about it, I'd love for them to have a soft landing when they get there. And that then goes down to the environment that we put the coaches in, you know? So this, that, that's an interesting point because that was, that, that in large part is, was the driving factor behind this five part series was to kind of create a soft landing because Great. a lot of what, a lot of what I see being done in the game of hockey and developing and practicing with players has traditionally been very linear. Mm. I don't see a lot of non-linear. And Stu, Stu talked a lot about these theoretical frameworks and approaches in episode one, breaking down what is ecological dynamics and, and constraints mm -hmm. that approach and non -linear. So that foundation was, was kind of put out there as, you know, here are options, here are things. And, and Stu talked about why they're beneficial and how they can work. This whole series the goal, if anything, of this whole series for coaches was to give them this insight into there are potentially other ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And if we start trying to do some of these other things, if we try to make our practice environments a little more nonlinear than always linear, if we adopted some of those principles of constraints-led approach uh, teaching and, and, and practicing and mm -hmm. ecological dynamics, what could be the ultimate benefits? And for me, I always bring it back to the conversations we've had today. I want my players to be skillful. I want them to be able to transfer it from the learning environment to the game environment or the training environment to the game environment. Mm -hmm. And once they've transferred it, I want them to be able to adapt it. I want it to be flexible and malleable so that any time a problem is presented to them, they can solve it. They have a way to solve it. And I don't, I don't know if the linear approaches I've used historically mm -hmm. accomplish that for me the same way. But like you, I still see there are times when doing things linear, not a, a total abandonment of I'm teaching technique today, you know, I, mm -hmm. I ran two 
you know, skill development sessions on the weekend. And in consultation with the coaches, uh, we came to the decision where what I needed to do was very isolated, linear activities as a starting point. As I was doing them on the ice, I was like, oh, I don't really want to be doing this. But we rationalized the need. Now the, the sessions moving forward will become more nonlinear, more transferable, adaptable in nature. So I like your point of it's not an all or nothing. There is room for both. There are rooms for rationalizing why and, and, and when. But I also love your points about as coaches, we need to ask more questions. We need to start stopping and thinking about what are the expectations we have of our athletes when the puck drops and they have to compete and play the game? And are we positioning them to do that effectively in the environments we create at practice time? Mm -hmm. Or are we just doing isolation, nonlinear, 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 and then we put them in this nonlinear ecological environment where we say, here, go solve all these problems and be variable and adaptable, but we've done nothing to help you do that. Right. Well, so uh, that that's a, that's a brilliant point because I, I, I'll speak to again my journey because you just meant there is it's not an all or nothing and so on and so forth, and yet over the thirty the thir my my thirty years of coaching I've gone from a place of utter <laughs> drills oriented, utter control. Yeah. I was a control freak, Brian. Everything went to time. Every part of the session was done to military precision. Boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? Yep. And did people improve? Yep. Could they have improved better? Probably is what I would now look back on. You know, but they did improve, even though it was highly, highly linear back in the day, let's say. Now, as, and as you said, not all or nothing. Did I begin to drip feed things in as I began to figure things out kind of 20 years ago and 15 years ago? And you know what I mean? As it began, I was like, huh, now I'm more comfortable with it that I probably would find myself in a situation that everything that I do is built around self-organization, is built around their capacity to engage with the, the task. If I'm looking out there, and, and again, I, and again, this has taken a lot of time. So it might be a lot short for some other people, or longer for others, but I know how much it's taken from me to get to where I feel so comfortable with it, let's say, right? And now I'm in a place where if you gave me a group of kids, like if you, if you said, Ed, take, the, take a hockey session now, I'd love it. Now I'd need someone to stand next to me so I didn't fall in the ice. Um, but I'd still be like, no, no, I want to I do it. I would happily jump in and take a hockey session. Even though I've never coached hockey before. But I've watched hockey on TV lots. So I'd be saying, okay, I have an idea what the game is. It is an invasion sport. They've got a goal here. We've, they've got, we've got a goal. They've got a goal. And we've got to get our puck, that puck into their goal, and then we've got to stop them getting their puck into our goal. Okay. That's like a lot of other sports. So the principles of play are about attack, uh, attack, defense, penetration, da da da, da all that. Right? Lovely. Transition plays and so on and so forth. I'd be like, okay. Take a session, Ed. Oh, great. So I would, I would... Be comfortable to say, okay, well, I want to set up a few scenarios here, guys, and I want to set up a, you know, whatever. I would, if I found myself in that situation, that the players were uh, not able for the scenarios I put them in because they were maybe too complex or too difficult, right? Maybe I put a too, too heavy a time constraint on it. You know, you've got to score and in 15 seconds. They just weren't good enough to move the puck up the ice in that amount of time and so on and so forth. I would resist the temptation now to stop it and go into some technical stuff because I feel, oh, if they were better at this right. skill, I'd take them over here and we would work on this skill and then we'd bring them back in. I wouldn't. I would just make an adjustment. I'd make an adjustment to the, to the scenario. I might say, actually, we're doing this, um, but I want, the, I want the, ball to be, the puck to be moved up the ice, so I'm going to take out one of the opposition players. Just to, that might afford them a little bit more time 
on the ice now. Or I might just move them further up the ice so that they're actually closer to the, uh, the end product of the goal to give them a shot off. Or I might start with, you know, having the opposition stand 15 feet back to give them again affordance, a different time affordance or a different space affordance once for them. But that's the point I'm, I'm, I'm making here. I'm now comfortable to be able to say, because I've layered it in so much over the years at right. different times and different things, to be like, actually, I don't know, do I need the isolated stuff anymore? Um, I don't know, could I rationalize? And again, you use that word, rationalize what I'm doing. I don't know, would I be able to rationalize to to isolate it down? And I'm talking, and even if I go now to the under 11s, the group where my boy plays in soccer, right? Um, I'm one of just the dads, right? Now, I'm also a dad whose full-time job is coaching as well, and the other dads there whose full-time job has nothing to do with coaching. And so if, we, if, if session design, and I don't run, I don't design the sessions or anything, I'm just, uh, hey, I'm happy to help, and the club has their people. But oftentimes what I'll do is when the session comes, it'll be, okay, this is what we're doing tonight, and I might just ask you, say, okay, I can see, but can we just make it a little bit more like the game? Because at the moment, it's very ordered and structured and linear. And it's, you know, and fortunately, I'm in a good, good place, good club where people are like, oh, yeah, actually, that makes a bit of And all it is is, oh, that makes a bit more sense. That's all it is. It's not, you know, <laughs> what are we doing? And oh, my God. You know, no, it's, it's okay. All right. I'm here with my kid. And this is what they're doing. Okay. Can we just move the dial a little bit? And every few sessions but we move it another little bit and, and all of a sudden as you begin to what I'm beginning to see is the other parents maybe engaging with the environment now more rather than engaging with the player they're now not trying to fix the player when things go wrong they're trying to make an adjustment to the environment to see how the players now react and that's a big difference yeah that's yeah. a huge difference that's not working. Stop, stop. Okay, that's not working. Everybody, let's do this. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Right. Okay, we got that now. Has everyone got it? Yeah, there was to be no mistakes. It's been perfect. Absolutely back into the game. Oh, it's not working again. As opposed to, hang on, there's something in the environment here that is making this break down. Because they clearly have, going back to that, they have technical ability to do this when we have them in an isolated way. But when we bring them in here, so they are skillful over there, but over here, they're not skillful. It's breaking down. But what we keep doing is we go back and then fix the skill. Isolate, like, fix no, no, it. Isolate, it, fix it, it decompose. It and it, it, it's interesting because Stu talked to that in episode one where he talked about when you when when you work on skill development, and I'll just use that as a, a blanket yeah, term, yeah. you know, when you work on skill development in isolation, and then you come into the game context, you pretty much have to learn it all over again. Because you learned it out of the game context, and now you're in a you know, the environment is different. And if the two things are not the same or relatively close to being the same. You have no transfer. You have no recall of how do I use this again? Why did I learn it? How did I learn it? Oh, I'm in a comfortable position where I'm familiar with this problem and I'm familiar with this environment and I know how to apply and I know how to be adaptable. No, because you did everything in isolation and and we get in that cycle. I see that a lot in hockey as well. The, the, the belief that I have to lay down the bricks first. I have to build the foundation with the bricks mm. before I ever start to build the house. Mm. And in a house analogy, that is very logical. <laughs> Hard to put on a roof yeah. if I don't have walls. Well, I get that. Yeah, yeah. But what if there was a way to build a house where I could build walls and roof and foundation collectively at the same time? Mm. Would but that, con- but would you're con- asking a lot there of the coaches to let go of a time scale there. Yes, 100%. Because the culture and traditions in a lot of sports are, well, by this stage, they should be able to do this. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so we can go over here and make it look like they can do it really quickly. And we can do this part of that session, every session for 10 sessions. Oh, yeah, they've got that now. That makes us look good now as coaches and feel good about as coaches too. Yeah, they've got that. 
And then they go in here and it's like, oh, as opposed to let's not break it down over here too much. And again, I appreciate there's some sports you got to break it down. I'm not taking a kid to the 10 meter platform and diving. Like, okay, just jump off and figure it out as you go down. Just adapt and self-organize for the water that's about to hit you. It's, it, we, again, within the right context, okay? But with kids, so that's the classic one, with kids, rather than taking them through this decomposed section here, I might say to the, to the, to, to the parents, to the volunteer coaches, I'm saying, okay, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to try and expose them to aspects of the game, not aspects of the sport. There's a big difference. Because the sport can be broken down, well, it's passing. So just pass up against the wall loads of times. So that's this. No, no, that's not in the game, though. Because in the game, the wall is moving. And in the game, the wall is going in to and fro. And in the game, there's somebody, there's another wall that's coming at you. Well, that, you know, in the game, there's actually no wall at all. But coaches, you've got to let go of the fact that that may not happen as quick and give you the soft sugar rush feeling lovely <gasps> it's working look they've got it but if you can let go of that and think you know what let's just for the season work in these scenarios then you've already bought you've already bought yourself some time to not be so specific in looking does he have it does she get it are they able to do it mm, they're not more of that and it's like oh no actually it's the other way <laughs> it's the other way so I think that's a key thing. If we are talking about getting them more comfortable to engage with more representative type of training and practice environments, we need to remind them it may take a little longer because they're more complex, these environments. So we're asking more of the kids. Now, again, that's where then we've got to be careful. I'm not putting six-year-olds straight into 4v4. I know in, let's say, soccer. I know soccer is 11 v 11, and I might think, oh, that's only 4 v 4 because they're six. Oh, hang on a second. Six? Let's just put them in <laughs> 1 v 1 because they've never, you know what I mean? Right. Let's yeah. take, but I'm still putting them in 1 v 1. I'm not putting them in 1 v 0 because, but again, I'm putting them in 1 v 1. And then I'm just en engage, see what emerges. Oh, even that's too difficult. Okay. So I might give them a little help. Or I might push the person a little further away, but I'm still having them realizing there is something else that needs that need that I need to attend to here, that I need to perceive and act upon rather than just my capacity to master the skill of this ball or this puck or this, you know? Yeah. And I think that's where the ball mastery or the puck mastery or whatever it is, that's where that can become troublesome for some coaches because they can maybe have the feeling that, but I want them to perfect this first and then we can. And I now of the school, I'm thinking, I think I can get them to really be pretty skillful with that in an adaptable way without him feeling like he's got to do a thousand in a row, you know, yeah. without any context of the game. Yeah. Um, but again, the rational... If we can encourage coaches to build their rationale for what they do on practice based on what it looks like in a game environment, that's a big step forward. Yeah. Because, because they may come back and think, well, I actually do need to do X, Y, and Z over here. Great. If that's a rationale that you've struck, you know, and it, and it looks like, feels like, smells like, tastes like the game, yeah, the but key, oftentimes they don't. One, one key that I hear there is I'm now building my rationale for doing isolated technique work or isolated skill work on my audit of what the game requires. Mm -hmm. So now that rationale perhaps becomes a little bit more justified. I need to do it because of this to come back to my representative design in practice to get the transfer and the adaptability rather than no no i just have to do isolation because they need to have all the building bricks before i ever 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 do this right so yeah. you know yeah. I, I was listening to um good heavens i forget the podcast title but philip o'callahan uh was the guest oh yeah on yeah. on mr tennis is is i follow yeah. him on Twitter. yeah yeah and he's a local local boy here he's in cork with us yeah yes 
And he made a really interesting comment. I actually wrote it down. And he, he, his comment was, we, what we want is skill adaptability, not skill repeatability. Hmm. And I just thought, wow. Like that, like to me, that is, if I, if I work in training environments that are representative, that are game-like, uh, that are competitive, that, you know, kind of buy in a little bit to the ecological dynamics impact and, and whatnot, and I use constraints, perhaps I will get adaptability. But if I lean into linear isolation, what I will get is repeatability. And repeatability just might not transfer and rear its head at game time. But adaptability mm -hmm. likely will every single time. Mm. Yeah, I would, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think, I look, and, and again, it goes back down to the, the kind of conversations we're having, even this conversation, you know, but other conversations other coaches are having. I think we need to, we need to uh, engage with it as a shared problem-solving task, not a, well, I know, and you don't, so let me tell you what you should be doing. That's just not, that's just a, an appalling way to engage with anybody to encourage them to want to do something, you know? And I think if we can actually be like, hmm, what do you, what do you think? That like you're the person with all the hockey knowledge, you know, you're the person who's played the game all your life and now is coaching for this and that. What do you, what do you, th what do you think? And it goes back to the, in that audit. What do you think? What is the game telling? What's the game asking of you? Okay. It's asking these questions of you, Right. Is your practice asking those same questions of you? If, they're, if it's not asking the same questions of you, stop doing it, is my, what I'm saying. Now, and I say that in different places. In the professional environment where I coach professionally, of course, there's a very different type of conversation being had. Why? Because there's livelihood at stake and there's major contracts and so on and so on and so on. You know, at the under 11s, uh, stage of play it's different conversations it's about fun it's about smiles and laughter and wanting them to come back and are they coming back and are our numbers increasing or decreasing or are we falling into the trap of everyone else telling ourselves we got great numbers as kids because at that stage they don't have a choice their parents are dropping them at training but then we see a massive drop off at 14 15 16 17 when they get a bit more autonomy and they choose i don't want to do it anymore Okay, so what, why are they stopping then? Well, you know why? Because they weren't being listened to when they were kids either. And one of the things I do a, a, a lot with coaches and coach developers is how much are you actually engaging with the kids that you coach? I know what it's like here in Ireland. Kids go to school and it's, you've got to put your finger across your mouth to put your hand up to ask a question. If you're walking in line, you, you were, okay, we're all going down to the yard now and it's everyone in line and fingers across your mouth and hands folded. It's all control. <laughs> and everyone's got to wear the same uniform on the same day with the same and then you're in the control. And I get it because maybe it would be a little bit crazier. Maybe. But I also think maybe they need to do it because what they're teaching the kids and the environment they create is boring for the kids. So that's why the kids push back. And then that's why they need to be controlled. I want kids to come to sport and come to their practice and feel like nothing is, nothing is like what it was in school. I'm not being asked to stand in a line. I'm not being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. I'm coming to play the sport that I want to come and play. Exactly. But I think if we begin to look a little deeper at this, when kids start getting a bit more autonomy in their early adolescent years, they're dropping out of sport. That's the, they're the hard facts that we see from the evidence. We've got to ask the question, why? Now we can throw things, oh, it's busier, and the boys find the girls, and the girls find the girls, and the girls find the boys, and the boys find the boys, and that, and that. great. Uh. But you know what? If it was a phenomenal environment, they really felt that they were heard and loved and da 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 and cared, that they had a voice, they wouldn't be dropping out in the, the numbers they are. The reason they're dropping out of sport is because it's too like school. It's not theirs. It's coaches being overly competitive on behalf of the kids. 
It's coaches talking about trying to do, you know, get, get a win for the kids. I, I, I coach my, my other boys under 15s team. And I know what I would have been like, and I only, can only imagine what I would have been like if I had him 30 years ago, you know? I'm so glad I'm coaching him the way, the way I coach now. And maybe in 10 years' time, I look back at this time and think, oh, God, what was I doing? And I, I hope it might even be better. But in the seven years I'm coaching this, I've never looked at a league table, not once. I don't need to look at a league table to, to tell me what's, you know, oh, this is a big game, at top of the table. No, that's not the environment I want to create for these kids. I want them to come because they want to come to training. And when they go and play a match, I want them to have the same sense of, okay, guys, so what are, what are the principles of our play? And da, 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 Okay, what are we going to be strong on today? Great. Not, this is the top four team. And we've got to get the win here. Da, 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 da. I've just changed. That's utterly different to the environment they have in training. But all of a sudden, on game day, they see a different coach. That's such a common thing we hear back from surveys with kids and adolescents. Is your coach the same on game day as he is in, uh, or she, he or she is in game day as in, the, uh, no. Oh, on game day, he's along the sideline, he's rah, rah, rah. And we're, so we're not, we need to do better across a whole host of things. And yeah, I know we're talking today about skill acquisition and so on and so forth. You know, if we're talking about kids, and I mean kids as opposed to adolescents under 12s, as opposed to 12 to 16, that's some of the most exciting work I'm involved in with the national governing bodies and stuff, which is to change the interaction, change the the engagement between a coach and a, and a child or an adolescent. Have that genuine. What is what is what? Are, what am I doing here? Have I? Gee, I'm actually. Fi I find. I'm shouting at a kid, like, <laughs> I'm screaming at a kid, I'm telling the kid what to do, and I'm getting annoyed with the kid for not giving a pass or giving it late or missing a chance, an opportunity to score. And that's, oh, that's, that's happening everywhere. But it's seen as okay, because I've got coach written on my back, and I've got my initials on my, on my, on the, on the, on my, my top, and I've got a whistle around my neck, and so that, that affords me an opportunity to be on a power trip. Not, not, and, and that, and that, maybe that, that's more the reason why I do what I do because I, in the small little more time I've got left, I'm 50 this year, love another few years, <laughs> but I have a feeling that not on my watch, not on my watch. If we're working with kids, if we're volunteering or we've been hired to work with kids, we need to do better by the kids. They need to come to practice to play, not to come to practice and feel like they're doing the exact same thing as they get in school. Just now they've got their skates on and they're on the ice. And I see it everywhere, Brian. I see it everywhere. And we've got to do better. I want kids to go to practice. And I want them to feel like, Mom, Dad, I love, we played. And I was asked a question and we did what I wanted to do. Let me ask you this question. If you go to your kids at the start of a training session, you say, okay, kids, what do you want to do today? What, what's the first thing kids will say when a coach asks them? What, okay, guys, what do we want to do? What will they say? Can we play? We play a game. Can we scrimmage? What do we say? Yeah. yeah. What, do we, what do we say? Yeah, we will. We, 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 we'll get to that at the end. But first I want you to... We just, we just lost them. Why not? Great. Let's play first. And this is then where that constraints-led approach comes in. Let's play first. Okay. What do you want to play? Well, we want to play 5v5 or 6v6. Or da, da. We want to play full pitch or we want to play half pitch. Great. Let's do it. They play. They're scrimmaging. They're doing... Well, lovely, good play, lovely, good, da, da. We're, okay, let's pause, come in for a water break. Okay, what was working out there, guys? Oh, our passing was really good. Okay, what else? Uh, what, what wasn't so working so well? Our oh, shooting, okay, right. Will we set up some scenarios that work on shooting? Not all of a sudden, okay, stand, keeper, goaltender, stand there, and we're going to hammer pucks at you. Yeah. No, let's set up scenarios where more shooting opportunities might emerge to give you a, a sense of, oh, is wh what part of my shooting isn't working? But we don't. Okay, hi, kids, great to see you. So what do you want to do? Uh -uh, we haven't even asked that question. Hey, kids, okay, get into line. Okay, we're over here. We're in the yellow cones first, and then we're in the blue cones. Blah, 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 blah. We don't ask them. Yeah. Why not? True. 
And I think all of that feeds skill acquisition because now they're going to be wanting to engage because all of a sudden they've got a curiosity. Like, for example, okay, because what do you want to do? Oh, Brian, Brian, what, what do you want to I think uh, we bring, what wasn't working? I was, okay, well, would you have an idea about how we would do that? Um, I don't know, maybe we could try. And it, it might be a harebrained idea, but all of a sudden, when Brian has just made a suggestion, it might be a harebrained idea. Yeah, let's try it. That kid is just, oh, I've got, I was asked a question. I made a suggestion and we're going to try it. It's, that doesn't happen in my world. No, but, and, and the thing, the thing for me, Ed, is that that type of approach takes time. You, yeah. can, you can't, you know, Stu mentioned this, you know, he asked, you know, what's the rush? We're always in a rush to get somewhere. If we, we, if we get rid of the rush and realize that we've got these kids in hockey, in soccer, in any sport, we potentially have these kids for eight, nine, ten years on a continuum, yeah. there is no rush. There's a progression of development that we have time to do those types of things and change the way we do things. That's a fabulous... Uh, I, I, spoke with, I spoke with a national governing body recently and they asked me a question. They were saying, Ed, you know, we're struggling. Our... Our, um, our bottom line takes a dive off a cliff at about from, from this age group on. We got to figure out how we, and said, I said, okay, you got to go way back. I said, because you're, the reason they're stopping playing is because they're not playing anymore. They go to practice to drill. They go to practice to be told what to do whenever else. They would not leave in the same numbers they leave if they feel like they've got a voice at training. So I said, that's, that takes time. And I, like you said, what's the rush? But I said, what happens is we get in such a rush, like Stuart said, we get in such a rush to get them better, faster, quicker, earlier. We remove whole swaths of kids who may be just late developers, who yeah. may have been firstborns, who may have been in a part of the city that there was no access to something, who may have been, who may, and there's a whole myriad of reasons why they're just late developers but then they're disenfranchised and they're gone and but but we'll we'll call and i hear these terms all oh, these generation y and generation i love working with kids like i don't see what i hear people saying oh they're snowflakes and this i don't see it in fact in fact when i ask them and engage with them I see incredibly capable, smart human beings, <laughs> incredibly, but they're just never asked. We think because I've done a foundation level course over one evening or an online thing one night or a weekend thing to get my level one that I now have this power and all of a sudden it, it, it's, not, it's not working. Cle clearly it's not working. <laughs> The stats are frightening for how the rate that we're losing kids in their teenage years. Frightening, in fact. Yeah. And it needs to, so it needs to stop. And this is part, of, like this is part of the process because when we look at the type of approaches to skill acquisition, the ecological approach appears to be more engaging because there's not waiting in lines. There... Um, engaging in a, in a very complex environment for the level that they're at. You know what I mean? It's, so it, it, it captures their imagination far more in the right hands, you know? Yeah. And, and that's, I suppose that's what's so exciting about conversations like this. But it's, it's, it's then, like anything, as I said earlier, it's, it's how we engage with the idea of being curious about what these different approaches are. And that's it again in the wrong hands. I think there's some people out there that I would absolutely um, silence in, in and be like, "Look, you need to step away for a while because you're far too aggressive with how you engage with people, either online. You know what I mean? And it's it's unhelpful on both sides, on both sides. Both and sides. we need we need a, just a softer landing for coaches to feel like, I love coaching, I love the game, I love the sport that I'm doing. I just like a little bit more help and yeah. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Dr. Ed Coughlin, <laughs> I hope that our discussion today will engage coaches and they will take this as a soft landing opportunity. 
uh, that they will unpack things we've talked about today, and they'll start to try some of this. They'll start to experiment and create their own soft landings and not feel mm -hmm. pressure to have to move into these, but just give it a try, experiment with it, play with it. Mm -hmm. uh, for the coaches that are listening or watching, Ed, how can they follow you online? How can they read more? Um, uh, they can contact me if they want by email. I, I'm happy. I happily give my email out because, um, yeah, it's important. It's as important to me to have pushback and challenge and stuff. So my email is drskillack uh, at gmail dot com is my personal email. Uh, Doctor D R S K I L L A C Q. Doctor Skillack at gmail dot com. I'm on uh, Twitter every so often. Not as much as maybe previously. It's not too sure I'm a, I'm a good fit for it. Um, at Dr. Skillack, D-R-S-K-I-L-L-A-C-Q. Um, and, and again, I think I need to maybe change even how I, 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 I there was times I suppose uh, on, on Twitter can get a little bit um, divisive. And I think it does. when we're talking about coaching and coach education, I think we need to be actually coming together more, not dividing. <laughs> Like, so I just I, I I take a little break from that every so often, um, and yeah, that's it. I'm more than happy to to chat with people and get on calls and just try and figure. Look, Brian, as we said before we started recording, I'm I'm just trying to figure this stuff out myself. So I'd hate for anyone to think that I have figured it out. Jeez, I haven't. Um, and equally, I make I make lots of mistakes in my current coaching and i'm 30 years in brian lots of mistakes um but i think at some point in time i just i let go of the idea of making a mistake was a bad thing and i just kind of embraced the fact that actually it might just be an opportunity of of figuring it out even better so don't don't kind of shackle myself too much i, I think i became very tense when i felt i couldn't make a mistake in coaching and as so, the more i've relaxed about it the more mistakes I've made, but the more learnings that have presented themselves to me to, to be picked up on, you know. So happy to engage with people. And on behalf of myself, Hockey Eastern Ontario, and all of our coaches that will listen and watch this, thank you so much for your time and your insight and the information you've shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.